and I'll share with you the PowerPoint. And what I was doing, can you still hear me, Jacob? Give me a thumbs up here. Yep. Yep, good to go. We, we were just giving you a justification for this thing called a magnetic dipole moment. And it came from this thing, which is an electric motor, where we were running current through it, as I was showing right here. Um, the force on either side, right here and right here, okay, gave us a torque. This tended to make this thing rotate uh, clockwise. And the force, and we're, we're kind of, we, we, are, we ascend, uh, we, we exceed the power of making current a vector to the electrical engineers, I think. We let them get away with the fact that we're not going to call current a vector. And so we kind of weirdly make L the length of the wire a vector. It's in the direction that the current is flowing. And if I want to get the magnitude of the force, I take IL cross B, sine of the angle in between them. And so that's what I was doing here. I'm taking the current times the length of the wire on this side, okay? And then the moment arm, you notice if this dimension is B and it's rotating about that axis would be B over two. And so that would be the net torque, okay? Net torque then I kind of group some terms, A times B, that's an area. It's conventional to have the area B in the direction normal. And we usually go in a right hand sense. So if you swing your fingers around uh, the current with your right hand, that's the normal we pick to the area, not the other one, okay? Any event, if I take the, Current times that normal times the magnetic field, that's going to be the torque. I've incorporated the sine of theta into the cross product. And then we choose to define the magnetic dipole moment as the current times this area, okay? And the, the area again being normal. If you uh, take a more advanced class, the current might or might not be constant. Um, in, so I might not have been able to do what maybe I should have written more generally. The current is sitting right in there. If the current is constant over um, an area then I can bring it outside and I just get the current times the area as the magnetic dipole moment. This is analogous to an electric dipole P, okay, where I have some length between the positive and the negative part of an electric dipole and we define P to be equal to the charge on either side, that maybe, as opposed to the negative charge on the other, times that length L, and it's defined the way I've shown it here, from the negative to the positive. Okay, that's an electric dipole, and it would rotate in an electric field. Similarly, a magnetic dipole here will rotate, and there it is. There's the area that I'm talking about. I just have to take the current, which is going around this loop right here, times the area of the loop, okay? And that's what mu is, a dipole. Hopefully everybody's good with that. That's why, uh, you know, if the dipole isn't lined up, it will swing around till it is lined up, then the angle between them is zero, there's no longer any torque. Okay, so that I, I put that out just because I'm sure you've all seen it. It may have been just for like a day, one class on this, and then we moved on when we talked about motors. Okay, well, if that's true, if, if this dipole here, this loop of wire with current in it is going to line up with the magnetic field. The question is how much potential energy does that have? Because that's what we're going to talk about in a quantum mechanics class. And remember that work is the negative of the change in potential energy. That, that's done by the field. Here I'm talking about the work I would have to do in order to take this dipole from maybe lined up and move its dipole moment that way, okay? And I think I would have to apply some amount of torque over that angle, and that is a work, right? Just like force times distance, torque times angle is work done. And uh, what I did is I took the torque equation from the previous u cross b, okay, times the sine of theta, and I put in the magnitude of that right there. And I said, since I'm doing the work, I'm increasing the potential energy of this thing. Right? If I let it go, it's going to snap back to be aligned up with the magnetic field. And so that's how I, I, I escape that negative sign in work and potential energy. I'm doing the work. The magnetic field isn't doing the work here. Okay, pretty straightforward, I guess, if I want to find that potential energy, though, because that's what, that's what we need here. I'm just going to integrate. And if I integrate U, I get or DU, I get U. I integrate, let's see, I got a constant, the dipole moment vector, the magnetic field, constant, assume constant here. Integral of sine of theta, D theta is what I got to do. That gives me a minus um, the constants times the cosine of theta. Integral of sine of theta is minus the cosine, plus a constant of integration, because this case I chose to do an indefinite integral. Okay. Now, you know, th this could be the way we'd have to learn this equation, but some smart person along the way said, hey, look, why don't we define the potential energy to be zero when the dipole is 
Oh, that's a lot. Oriented just with its dipole moment vector right there. It's supposed to be a vertical line. Why do we call that the zero point of potential energy? Okay, and that, that kind of makes life good because if I define the potential energy to be zero right there, I put zero when cosine is zero. Uh, let's see, cosine, of, cosine, I'm sorry, 90 degrees right there. I make zero at 90, cosine of 90. Cosine of 90 is zero. So I say zero, well, you zero then has to be equal zero. The constant integration goes away if you do that. Kind of a clever step. Otherwise, you'd have to always be carrying that term around. But you have to accept then that for this dipole to get to a lower potential energy, right, it has to go negative. And that's the meaning of this negative sign, of course. Zero's right there. It's certainly going to, because of this torque, um, it'll go back against me who wound it up that direction, okay, it'll go to this lower potential energy, that lower potential energy will be minus the dipole moment times the magnetic field times the cosine of zero. And that's certainly less than zero, and you just have to live with that. And then that gets you out of that constant of integration right there. And so that's what people have done over the years. And we do exactly the same thing for electric potential energy. We go minus P dot E, electric potential energy of a dipole is defined exactly the same way. So these equations are consistent. All right, here's the big inconsistency. Units on this guy, joules, and it was in your 112 class, okay? And then in, in quantum mechanics, for whatever reason, mystery to me, we write it as V for the potential energy in joules. So in the Hamiltonian, when I go P squared over 2M plus the potential energy, I mean exactly this for a dipole. So when I put in an additive potential energy, this becomes a V because that's how we've redefined it. I, I hate that because, you know, U is in joules in an in a, in a intermediate introductory kind of class, and yet we make V be the thing in joules. Well, potential, is, as you know, is joules per coulomb. Um, yeah, they're related, but can we stay consistent with the uh, symbols? And of course, the answer is that is no, we can't. All right, so in any event, that's the new Hamiltonian now with, of a dipole in a magnetic field. And I, I wanna kind of come up with a classical um, relationship between this spin we've been talking about and this dipole that I hopefully just refreshed you on. If you were good at it, then I apologize for wasting your time with it. But let's see, um, this is what we said a dipole is, it's a current times an area. And what does that mean here? What does that mean? Well, I think, go back to a definition of current in a wire, and it is a charge. Well, we certainly have that here in a hydrogen atom. So I got a proton and I got some electron and somehow it's swirling around. And I'm not trying to imply an orbit here, but it's doing some kind of swirling around here. I clearly have that, but unlike a wire, I don't have any of that, right? I don't have a number of charges per volume. I don't have a drift speed. I don't have a cross-sectional area on the wire. Instead, what I have though, remember current, is how many coulombs pass a point every interval of time, every second. And so if I sat, say, right here with a stopwatch, and I timed how long it would take that charge to kind of swirl around, not necessarily in an orbit, till it came back near my stopwatch again, I would say that the current is just that charge in coulombs, 1.6 times 10 to minus 19 coulombs, divided by the period, right? And so, yeah, while this equation works really good for a wire, that's not what the situation I have here, but I could come pretty close to it. It justifies why the charge has to be the charge on an electron, and the time interval for this current to occur is one period. Well, remember, the reciprocal of the period is the frequency, so I've got the charge on that electron times the frequency, and um, we want to write this in terms of not the frequency in cycles per second in hertz, but in radians per second. And so all I got to do is take um, omega divided by two pi, and that is frequency, or, or go the other way. Uh, you know, I've replaced omega over two pi here for frequency. Okay. And so what am I doing right then? I guess I'm trying to get current. There it is, E uh, times omega over. 2 pi. And then I said, well, the area approximately pi times the radius squared. And so there's the area. So I've got current, area, and of course the pi cancels. And E r squared over 2 times omega, that must be the dipole moment. Classically, 
and it, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about an orbit, although I recognize in a real, um, and we'll talk about the, the, the differences, in, in a real atom, even a hydrogen atom, it, it's not an orbital motion, but that's what we would decide classically. Okay, and, and I'm going to do a similar thing with spin, even though, you know, we said spin is a pointless particle. I'm going to remember that we said it's a moment of inertia times an angular velocity. And for a point particle, I just want you to remember, mr squared, that's a moment of inertia, right? And so that's what I did right there. Um, and I guess now um, that allows me to solve for omega here. I can take omega and it is the spin divided by the moment of inertia. And so I, I took my dipole moment from right here. And then in place of moment of inertia, I pick that. And of course, it's a lie, right? An electron doesn't have a radius, but I'm just trying to justify a result because if you look right, happen the first thing that happens is the radius cancels. So the fact that an electron doesn't have one doesn't really matter much, and I'm left with the fact that the dipole moment vector is directly proportional to the spin and what's left: the charge on the electron, the mass on the electron. Because I had to divide that away from moment of inertia, and it's factor of two. Okay, and so we're going to lump all these constants right here into something that our author calls the gyromagnetic ratio. He gives it the symbol gamma. And I have seen as I read, um, that's exactly how some authors define the gyromagnetic ratio. But you should be careful because this is a nice classical expression. It's true for a classical particle that might be orbiting in a formal orbit. And we know that's not what happens. And we also know that there's no size to the spinning electron. That would be the answer though. Okay. But when we look at relativistic quantum theory, which we're obviously not doing in this class, it turns out that the answer is twice that. The answer for this gyromagnetic ratio as defined by the author of our textbook is just the charge to mass ratio, okay? And so what folks who have studied relativistic quantum theory have done is said there must be some constant associated with an electron that this guy gets multiplied by. And you can prove that constant using relativistic quantum theory. And for an electron, it happens to be minus two. It happens to be a different number for a proton. If I was making the same argument for a proton, that would be the number. A neutron, oddly enough, is a negative number. And I've often seen this constant right here, this G defined and called the gyromagnetic ratio. So, you know, we've, we've talked about this with the indices on the Laguerre polynomials, the uh, where's the two pi in the Fourier transform. Here's one more in physics where you might read one reference and the gyromagnetic ratio is this Greek letter gamma, which I'm gonna use right here. Other books you'll read will cause this constant that you multiply the classical result by. They'll call that the gyromagnetic ratio. So just be careful as you're, as you're reading. And uh, I think there is a type Typo in the worksheet that you're doing for today on magnetic fields because he drops that. He does say correctly that G is two in the typo on the, uh, 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 that's not the typo, but he does leave that two right there. Those two cancel. And the, uh, the gyromagnetic ratio, uh, according to relativistic quantum theory, for an electron spinning is just E over M. Okay, and so it, it isn't necessarily important to the completion of the worksheet, but it is important to the science, which is what we're just taking you through here. Okay, so in any event, we've got a dipole proportional to spin, this thing that we've got an operator for, right? And so I want to talk about what is called a particle at rest. And, you know, you say, well, if it's at rest, it's not spinning. No, no, it's free to rotate but otherwise it's stationary. Okay, let me get that out of the way for the recording. Free to rotate, otherwise stationary. And all that means is there's no translational momentum, so that term is zero. We still have the potential energy term, which we just showed is minus mu dot b, the potential energy of a dipole in a magnetic field. And we just showed that the dipole can be written as this gyromagnetic ratio times the spin vector, which is a spin operator, okay, something we can measure an X and a Y and a Z component for, and we have dotted with the magnetic field, okay? And so I plug that in right there. All right, well, let's think about a magnetic field in the um, Z direction, okay? And uh, let's see, this was the poly spin matrix C right here, one minus one diagonal, and then if you slap on the H bar over two, you do get the Z component of spin. And of course, that has the eigen values of h bar over two and minus h bar over two and the one zero zero one the x direction y direction if you like spinners 
which are the eigenvectors of this operator. Okay, great. And so if I'm trying then to construct the Hamiltonian for a spinning electron, it seems to me that um, all I got to do is take a magnetic field. Let's have one that's also in the z direction. Okay, so let's just imagine a, uh, a magnetic field in the z direction. It's convenient because spherical coordinates sets us up nicely that way. Let's just talk about that one. Okay, and so I guess gamma times B0, let's see, gamma times B0 times S would, times the z component of S would be what the Hamiltonian is okay, as an operator. And I did the dot product, so if that's in the z direction and I only use the z component there, I'm good to go. I've got an, a z component magnetic field and a z component of spin, and I'm just multiplying them together. That's an easy problem to do, I guess. Um, you don't have to worry about x and y components. We'll talk about that in a bit here. Okay, so that would be then the Hamiltonian operator in this case. Just bring that with its eigenvalue h bar over two and this diagonal uh, matrix with the eigenvalues one and minus one times h bar over two, just like we've talked about. Well, if the eigenvectors are the one, zero, zero, one for z component of spin, for this energy eigenvalue problem, because that's what we're doing here, right? We're going Hamiltonian on the state, I guess, and we'll talk about spinner states. I might change that notation again, is equal to E times this chi, the state again, okay? And, uh, you know, those are, those are the eigenvectors for that state. It's either that one or that one. Those are two that work. And there's an energy associated with one, there's an energy associated with the other, and apparently it's just the h bar over two with the gyromagnetic ratio and the magnetic field. And that's the energy of the spinning particle, the two possible energies of this particle spinning, uh, spinning in this magnetic field in the z direction. All right, so what's the state of the particle overall? not just the eigenvector states, the actual state of a particular particle, I suppose. And uh, I, I uh, just brought over the operator again with its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And in order to, have to answer the question, well, what's the state of a particle? I, at the very least, have to know what the particle is doing at t equal to zero here. And so for now, let's just say it has some value a and b for the, uh, for the Eigen for the for the vector which is the state initially, right? And you can write it this way. We're saying it's a superposition of the up state and the down state, if you like. Those are, are words I can live with. And of course, remember that a squared and b squared here is the probability that you'll find the particle once you measure it in either the up state or the down state, a squared or b squared. And that was work from uh, from Wednesday. All right, you know, way back along, I um, guess chapter one, maybe chapter two, chapter two, I think is when we did this. We said, all right, if I know the initial state, a and b here, sometime later, what do I do? And hopefully you recall, what we did, what we said the answer was, and we did it without, well, we did prove it, I guess, uh, because we solved the differential equation. You slap on e to the minus uh, the energy over the over h bar times time, and these are the possible energy eigenvalues. And, you know, for an infinite square well, there's an infinite number of energy eigenvalues for us as a uh, uh, quantum harmonic oscillator. There's an infinite number of these two. For spin, there's two up and down energies, right? And so you just put that guy up for there and you put that guy right for there and um, uh, you can write what the state of these things are. And it, you know, you can see on my slides, if you like the column formulation, I write it and then I write just more like a unit vector notation. They're the same. And so I did that again right here. There's the column formulation. And if you like kind of seeing it as a unit vector in the, where, where the, the eigenvector is like the unit vector, I'll write it that way too. Okay, and so that's, uh, that's what we've done. And then I just substituted in what the plus and the minus eigenvalues are right here. And you can see the H bar does cancel, right? Because there's an H bar there and an H bar there, they cancel. And I'm just left with the gyromagnetic ratio, the magnetic field and the two, and it's either plus or minus depending on which one I'm talking about. Uh, the top one here, it cancels, and the minus sign cancels. The bottom one, it doesn't cancel. Okay, and so that's my state. I'm going to, for reasons that'll be obvious here in a second, I'm going to say, well, let's let A and B be these two numbers right here. 
the cosine of an angle over two and the sine of an angle over two. And that may be wacky. And you might say, okay, you, you're looking at ahead of the problem. But one of the things you have to admit about that is the state has to be normalized, right? And that means that a squared plus b squared has to be equal to one. Well, these are certainly two values of a and b who when I square them and add them, they're one by a, a, you know, probably the only trig identity everybody for sure knows, cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. So check, right, that works. This, this is a good normalized initial state. Um, it, you'll see in a second why I picked alpha here, okay? So instead of a and b, I put in cosine of alpha over two, sine of alpha over two. And then I rewrote it, if you like, the kind of unit vector uh, formulation as opposed to the, the, the column vector, okay? That's the state uh, at any time, right? Now, on the tutorial for today, I just want to tell you something. He changes the notation a little bit. Instead of chi, okay, and I wasn't even putting the, the ket on it, he says, okay, psi, and a and b become f and g, which are a function of time. And let's just make sure that we agree that we can slap on that e to the minus i e of the state divided by h bar over t by no kidding solving the first order linear differential equation. And, and so you should do that. Okay, so here's the eigenvalue problem. Actually, here's time, well, it's time in time dependent Schrodinger wave equation. Okay. It starts to look like an eigenvalue problem, but we've got IH bar, the derivative of the state with respect to time, the full Schrodinger equation. I rewrote that because that is the Hamiltonian for this stationary but spinning electron. And then I put the state instead of A and B, F and, and uh, G. And then of course that's equal to IH bar times the derivative of the state. So I left the IH bar out, but I looked at the derivative and it seems to me there is a differential equation to be solved there, right? Because if I take those constants, gamma B zero H bar over two, and then I multiply them by uh, one times F and zero times G. So that would just be F. That's gotta be equal to the derivative with, of f with respect to time from the other side of the equation, right, uh, with an ih bar. So that and that have to be equal to that times that row times that column, which winds up just being that. So that's a differential equation you can solve for f, okay? And you should find out that when you do separation of variables um, and integrate, yeah, you get something that's of that form. And you can do the same thing for G. I think the only difference when you do it for G is that negative sign there. So I just said, I just asserted, I can add that on to the initial condition, just slap it on, because we've done that before. We're asking, hey, go back to chapter two and just convince yourself that these two things right here will be able to just allow me to have that piece right there, that E to the minus, whatever the energy is, divided by H bar times time. Okay, so solve for f here, do the differential equation. And once you do one, just show the other one with, this, with the uh, negative sign in the appropriate spot. Okay, so once we've got this though, whether you, know, you have to show it, um, I've just kind of written what I did by slapping on the exponential term, what we call the wiggle term. But what I wanna do is I wanna find the x component of spin. And I'm gonna leave just, for you because it's on a tutorial what the y and the z component are. Those are gonna be the answers so you can check your work. But here's how you get the x component of the expectation value of spin. Let's say it the other way. Spins, x components, expectation values, probably getting the order better. Just like we've always done this, okay, if you use the tutorial notation, I've been using chi here. Actually, I should be pointing to the other one. I've been using that. Remember, this is complex, right? This means you're taking a complex conjugate of that, just like that always meant the complex conjugate of psi when it was in the bra side, okay? And um, just to, if we're using the column and row vectors, that's truthfully more than just a complex conjugate. I said, whenever you had a bra, you wrote it as a row. Well, that really means you're taking the adjoint, and that's what this symbol means. Don't make much out of it. If there was a column vector right there, you couldn't do the multiplication. You need a row vector there. A complex conjugate that is has the transpose of the elements turns a, col a column into a row. Now that's a transpose. And so um, uh, th that's what this symbol means. It's the adjoint symbol. It looks like a dagger. Okay. So anyway, that's all that means is take my state 
that I had and write it as a row vector. And you notice where this used to be a positive sign, it's now a negative sign because I took the complex conjugate. And where this term used to be a negative sign, it's now a positive, okay? And compare that to the other side right here, which is this side. You can see it's exactly what I said. I, I took the complex conjugate and then I got to do this multiplication on, of course, S here, the X component of spin. Okay, well, I did it. I went multiplied, I put the H bar over two out front, and then I went zero times that, one times that, got that thing. I went one times that, zero times that, got the other. And notice the result from there is I just, I flipped these two guys around, right? That's what multiplying by this does. It takes whatever was in the first element and switches it around to the second element. Okay, so I'm halfway there. Now I gotta do the rest of the multiplication. I gotta multiply by that chi dagger thing, which is right there. Okay, and so let's see, it's that times that, that times that. So that's what I wrote, that times that, that times that, that times that. And hopefully I got the signs correct. Yeah, and oh yeah, what happened here? See, I got that thing with the minus sign multiplied by that thing with the minus sign. And so you notice there's no longer a one half right there because I added the exponents. And one half plus one half is a whole again. So no divided by two there. And I, when I did that and that, the very same thing, no longer divided by two, right? Okay, so that's kind of nice. Um, I did see that this term and this term were common. And you know it's a simplification uh, reg regimen I'm following here. So I factored it out along with the h bar over two that was already factored out, okay? And then what do I have right here? Well, son of a gun, if Euler's identity doesn't tell me that that is twice the cosine of that exponent right up there, isn't it? Okay, so we're rolling. So I turned those complex exponentials into a real cosine, bought me a factor of two, right? Because I normally would divide by two in order to get a cosine there. But then I looked at this guy right here with that factor of two, and I found a trig identity. It's actually in the back cover of your textbook that says that guy is equal to sine of double the angle. Okay, and so that's why the things in square brackets just became sine of two times alpha over two, which is sine of alpha. And so apparently, that's the X component of spin in time. And if you work through the same problem, you're gonna get a similar answer, okay? That's the Y component. You notice the difference? That cosine here changed to a sine. This stayed the same. And instead of plus H bar over two, the one eigenvalue, uh, you get the minus H bar over two with the other one. Funny how that works. And if you did exactly the same thing with the Z component, you'll notice that the Z component doesn't have a time term. It is just a constant. And that's sort of the way we set the problem up, isn't it? So we now have, and you're going to have to show uh, X. I showed X. You're going to have to show Y and Z. I suppose you can just kind of copy my work for the, the X, but then follow it along to do Y and Z in the tutorial, and you'll find that those are your answers. Okay, great. Um, what it means. Let's look at the components. I've just recopied them here. Okay. Um, and I chose to make a substitution for this gyromagnetic ratio times the magnetic field, because anytime I have something multiplied by a time in a cosine or a sine, I think of it as some kind of frequency, right? It is an omega. Uh, it has units of radians per second, and that's what omega is, so that when you multiply it by time in seconds, you got radians of phase, I guess, that you take the sine or the cosine of. Your calculator better be in radians, is what I tell the 112 students when you see something like that. We've defined that omega, the product of the gyromagnetic ratio in the magnetic field, to be something called the Larmor frequency, okay? It, we had an example of a cue ball spinning in a gravitational field um, in the advanced lab. And what you'll find is if you, that's the axis of rotation that this thing is spinning on, the gravity will cause this thing to rotate around, won't it? And we refer to that as precession. So this Larimore frequency must be precession of some sort. And let's see if it is. Let's put the total um, expectation value of spin Take its x component, multiply by a unit vector in the x component in the x direction, y, y, z, z. Okay, so I wrote these things and just put them with their appropriate unit vectors. And then I did what I thought was sort of some clever factoring. Okay, obviously the h bar over two out front, but then I factored out the sine of alpha from the x and the y component right here and left what was left. 
And then I have, there's the Z component, I guess. And what I find, I guess, first of all, is if you square this, you square this guy, you square that guy, you square that guy, add them up, okay, and then take the square root. Well, let's see. When I square these two guys, I got a sine squared and a cosine squared. That's just one. And that's, that leaves me one, and I'm squaring that guy. That's a sine squared and a cosine squared. Everything in the square brackets here is just one. And so I'd have squared that and you'd take the square root. Apparently the magnitude of this thing is just H bar over two. So I've got H bar over two is the magnitude of this, of this spin vector, not any of the components, the whole deal. Okay. And then I look at, it, I go, okay, well, there's a Z component right there. That's this piece. And this is why I say it was nice because alpha is just like theta in spherical coordinates. It turns out that was kind of a clever selection when I said, let's let A and B be cosine of alpha over two and sine of alpha over two. Because now all of a sudden I'm just getting uh, for this term right here, the component along the Z axis. And this guy along the, uh, oh, and while I'm there, the component then in the XY plane right here, that would be H bar over two times the sine of alpha, right? And of course, I, what I said is, is true right there. That would be uh, H bar over two times the cosine of alpha. And, but is this thing stationary? No. In the XY plane, hopefully you realize um, that guy and that guy. Now, did I drop a negative sign here? Yes, I did. Where's the negative sign? Y right here is negative. So shouldn't that be negative right there? I'll fix it and repost. That's a negative right there. And shouldn't that be negative right there? And I think the answer is yes, it should. Okay. Negative, negative, negative. Okay. And so that means, I think, let's see, if it was, po if everything was positive, it would be going, uh, that there's positive theta for both of them would be that way. In this case, I think it's negative. One of them's negative. So it's rotating. This, this component right here is rotating around that way in the XY plane. And sure enough, that's why this diagram from your textbook shows omega that way. So Lattimore uh, frequency actually is a precession, just like a cue ball processes around a gravitational field. It's vertical um, in the advanced lab. And if you haven't seen that cue ball doing its thing, um, ask maybe Kaiser or, uh, or uh, Tech in the fall to show it up. I'm not sure who's going to be teaching advanced lab, but uh, you'll see it then. All right. Any of it, that's, uh, that's what this means, I guess. That's how spin sets up in a, um, in a magnetic field that's vertical. Now, I want to show you about a, a famous experiment, and I just say a few words about it. Uh, this time, I'm going to change the magnetic field to be inhomogeneous, and I get this stern gerlach field. You may ask, what's an inhomogeneous magnetic field? There's one right there. See how it's got a different magnitude along the North Pole than it does because the field lines are closer near the South Pole. So I guess it's stronger as you move upwards. And that's what I'm trying to show here. As you move positive in the Z direction, uh, the magnetic fields increases. Now, I have to tell you, for reasons that have to do with the fact that the divergence of a magnetic field has to be equal to zero, which is a requirement, that's uh, Gauss's law for magnetism, okay? it has to have some accompanying field. If the Z component is going to get bigger, either an X or a Y component has to be getting smaller. Okay. And that's what we're showing here. And it, that just to make the divergence go to zero. Don't worry about that term. We'll talk about it later. What we want to focus on is we've got some magnetic field in the Z direction and it's increasing as I move upwards in Z. And that's kind of demonstrated right here. And so I guess I'm going to run a beam of uh, some kind of atoms, hydrogen maybe, if I could, would be great. Actually, they, the first time this experiment's done, it's silver atoms. And let's see, gamma s dot b, gamma s dot b. Oh, I'm looking for a force here, aren't I? So let's talk about that for a second. If our potential energy is u minus uh, the dipole moment vector with the magnetic field dotted together, isn't the force the gradient of you with a negative sign. I'm, I'm hoping that somewhere along your physics life, somebody has told you if you take a derivative with respect to say X and you take the negative of it, that should be the X component of force. In three dimensions, it just means take the gradient of that potential. 
Okay. And that's what we're doing here. Okay. And so if I take the gradient of this potential and we said that the dipole uh, was the gyro magnetic ratio times the spin vector. Okay. I take the gradient of that. I should get a force. And so let's take the dot product first to get the uh, potential. And all I did is I multiplied the magnetic field right here by gamma S. There's the X component multiplication. There's the Z component multiplication right there. And I just did the dot product. No kidding. X component, X component, Z component, Z component. And then I took the gradient and the gradient says take the derivative of all this thing with respect to X and multiply it by a unit vector in the X direction. So the only thing that uh, varies with X is right there. The derivative of X is just one. And so those terms come right there. Of course, the magnetic field zero, zero right here is a constant. So I take the derivative of all that with respect to Z and I multiply by a unit vector in a Z direction. That's the answer you get there. And so I can factor out the gyro magnetic ratio and this factor that shall, it shows how much the magnetic field is increasing and bring it outside. And I'm just left with this. Okay. And so apparently though, this, because the, remember the, the spin vector is processing, this term here over time, as the spin processes around, it's going to average out. You know, some of the time it'll be one way, some of the time will be the other way, but this will average out. By the way, if I had chosen the Y direction to have a change in the magnetic field, it would, I'd be saying the same thing about the Y component of spin. Over time, this will average out. But what I should see is a constant Z force, remember that's what I'm finding, Z component of force here, equal to the gyro magnetic ratio times whatever the rate of change of this magnetic field in the Z direction is times the Z component of spin, right? And so here's the experiment, I guess, if this is all true, as I run this beam of particles, maybe they're hydrogen atoms, through this thing, some of them should, with spin up, should be bent that way, and some of them spin down should be bent that way. And it was actually this discovery which led uh, a couple of scientists whose name I'll give you in just a second in order to figure out that, yeah, this spin thing had to exist. Now, I have to tell you real quick as we're finishing up here, this is sometimes called the um, normal Zeeman effect is what I've heard. It when they first set up this experiment, they didn't know about spin. They were actually looking at orbital uh, motion and hoping to see this force that we we possibly comes out here in an inhomogeneous uh, magnetic field. They they were hoping that that was going to come from the differences in orbital angular momentum, and they were kind of thinking, well, if I went from a two p state, uh, which has l equals one, and therefore has m sub l equal to one zero and minus one. Well, that should be able to be differentiated as that relaxation occurs down to a 1s state, a zero state, I, in, a, in a vertical magnetic field again. They were hoping to see three different lines. They were hoping that if it was in the m sub l minus 1, that would be bent downward. The one at m sub l equal to 0 would, be, um, would not be bent at all. And of course, if m sub l uh, was equal to 1, it would be bent up. Spin doesn't have that. Spin has the one halves. Okay, when the experiment was first set up, it was hoped that the, the the force would be due to these differences, up, nothing, down, and so that was what the people were originally looking for. Here's the picture, exactly the same inhomogeneous uh, magnetic field. We throw some p-state atoms in here. We're hoping they're going to be bent up. This is saying exactly the the work I did. Again, it was, it's that rate of change of the magnetic field in the Z direction, which gives us a force, okay? And so that's what they were hoping was going to happen. What they found, well, classically, we'd just expect a smearing, right? We were hoping that for L equals zero, they got this. Instead, they got that. It's still split anyway for the L equals zero case. And they never really saw the L equals plus one and minus, okay? So they were wondering, did they just not see that thing at the center? And they were pretty sure they were putting in L equals zero and it was still splitting anyway, which was not what was expected. Okay. This is the kind of results they would get imaging these electrons as they hit something. Kind of looks like a, a up thing and a down thing. And, and this paragraph just talks to you about the, how, how difficult the alignment was of this experiment. Okay. And you can read more about it. Well, the fact that it's split into two lines uh, based on, uh, as opposed to three, 
kind of told them that, you know, orbital angular momentum isn't what's causing this to happen. And it led Goldschmidt and Ullenbeck uh, to propose that it isn't just about orbital angular momentum. There must be this spin intrinsic to the electron that is causing this splitting into two lines up and down. Ernfest went on uh, working it out mathematically for us, I guess, uh, because he showed that if this thing was spinning, the electron uh, would have to be moving fast in the speed of light. So there were some issues with it. But uh, Goldschmidt and Nulenbach just came back and said, well, it's intrinsic. Um, quantum number plus or minus a half. And that's what we've got today. And, and now this experimental result verifies the theory. We pull it all together and we should be good to go. All right, I think that's about all I wanna say. Um, yeah, that's our picture, I guess. Uh, this is that the two spins processing around right here. And so I, I, do, I do think it adds a quantum number for us, right? We talked about uh, for angle momentum and energy N, we had the L, and I subscripted today the M associated with all that guy for orbiting M sub L. But now we're pretty sure there is this other M that I didn't subscript that we've been using for spin up and down. And of course, this guy right here should be, should be um, um, spinning around here. Okay, that's what I got. Any questions? I mean, I guess it's good that I didn't go too long today because of the technical issue with voice. Y'all have a great weekend. Um, I'll set up office hours for later on. You take care now.